on this computer. Great, we, we dived straight in, but I think that point that that, that, that we were just on, um, how long has this actually been going on and that it is literally close to 10,000 years um, in some areas, eight and others, five and others, but it's the beginning of blob-based agriculture, the, the beginning of structures of power over that created what we would these days call unsustainability of our right. patterns. But it's also really good to remember that actually it's always been only a relatively proportionately small percentage of humanity that had that pattern. And right. yet it caused so much damage and particularly in the last 250 years. And, and yeah, anyway, just to frame this in, in case we do share it with somebody, um, yeah. we, we've had a couple of communications where like I always see myself as, as as the person who's telling people, no, it's not about regenerative good sustainability bad and and all of that. And then, but but we had some comments where you you were saying, I'm pu putting fuel into that division, and so I'd, I'd love to have that conversation with you because I I care for your um, opinion, and and I don't see myself that way. So let's 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 dive straight in. Um, yeah, that sounds good, and and yeah. you know I I I think that. You know, one framing is that that there is, um, there there are sort of um, approaches that look at regeneration and sustainability and see regeneration as um, sort of um, uh, higher or more important or more evolved, one might say, than sustainability. And so I, I, you know, one thing I'll take accountability for is that this is a much broader um, narrative than, than uh, something that you might be articulating. This is something that's sort of articulated in many different places. And there's also, you know, I also will acknowledge that there, you know, the distinctions between sustainability and regeneration do have implications that, that warrant um sort of evaluative assessments i'll put it that way yeah, and, um, and we're, we're having this conversation in the backdrop where over the last like i mean when we first started talking maybe five six years ago um the group of people talking about regeneration was actually relatively small still and that's right and so i think that signal to noise ratio was actually pretty good back then but but just as what happened with sustainability over the last 25 30 years is everybody talks about it, but the, that means that the noise goes up and the signal <laughs> goes down, and 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 so now a lot of people are confused because, like, ex McKinsey partners at Systemic have quickly jumped onto the um, regenerative bandwagon and are selling um, old wine and new wineskins, and some people value them because of their background so highly that they think these must be the guys to go to to understand regeneration, and then these confusions happen. That's right. I think I think that we we definitely see eye to eye that there has been an an historic um, co optation of the term sustainability. So there's there's roots in the literature and in I would say sort of systems thinkers interpreting sustainability in a very rigorous way that then got applied in the corporate realm in particular and diluted and co-opted in ways where now the term sustainability, you can't really use the term sustainability in a, in a general setting and be confident that you're being understood correctly because the term has been so deeply co-opted. As you're saying, the same thing is happening right now as we speak uh, to the term regeneration. I, I'm just wondering where your take is on this. And this might be a point where we either agree or disagree. But for me, if you look at the history of the concept of sustainability or the people working on it, the big co-option started with the Brundtland report. And everybody who's jumped on the bandwagon since then uses the Brundtland definition, which is the biggest co-option of, 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 of a much more holistic, much more systemic, much more... The, evolutionary approach um, that understood subsidiarity and the need to start in place previously. And, and then it suddenly became the global abstract UN uh, uh, conversation about um, solving problems and um, about 
abstract goals that were globally defined, and then we were surprised that they're difficult to land locally. Yeah, I, so I would I would agree. I think that the the Brundtland definition is a is a kind of double edged sword in the yeah. sense that I think that the Brundtland definition got it right in terms of the intergenerational and frankly intragenerational equity component of sustainability. So I think that sort of the most widely used definition coming from the Brundtland report did get it relatively right, so to speak. I think that so yeah. to my mind it's still so, sorry to interrupt, but to my mind it still um, cranks up the utilitarian value approach that is my fundamental critique of sustainability, even in its historical roots. Like if you go back to Karl von Karlewitz in German forestry, it was already an approach of saying, "Oh, we need to be taking care of our woods and." grow them sustainably so we can harvest them sustainably but but it wasn't necessarily so they give back like like context to hundreds of and thousands of species that um the health of our ecosystem depends upon it was already a so we can use more wood yeah I, so i you know the way that i've talked about von karlowitz in the past is that essentially uh, von Karlowitz is a an indication that the 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 concept of sustainability emerged because of the emerging practice of unsustainability. So, in mm -hmm. other words, before unsustainability, when humanity or, or or even other species operate in a sustainable way they're doing that unconsciously and they're doing that by tuning into their environment. Uh, and, and you could say that, you know, um, uh, evolution takes care of that uh, in a in sort of a, a, a broad reaching way. Well, it, it's, it's, it's interesting because if you really tease this apart in terms of the cultural dominance of perspective and all of that, uh, even that, that perspective is actually coming out of um, the narrative of separation, the narrative of, uh, right. like, like for me, there's a couple of things that I, I think are really relevant to contextualize how I'm, I'm thinking about this. What, one of them is that increasingly as a biologist, I'm understanding how even the decision to see the world through the categories of species and the mm -hmm. units of individuals and then begin a narrative or a scientific investigation around how they relate is already a meta design and organizing idea that shapes how we then think about it. If we think of life as a planetary process expressing itself through millions and billions of individuals and millions of species, then we can talk about the same thing, but the foregrounding of this Kuhnian Gestalt cube is the totality in dynamic transformation. And the minute we take yeah. it apart, it's beginning to be the competition story and the scarce resource story and and and, and the Darwinian story, which which has its own framing issues. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I would agree with you on that. And I would say that, you know, I think if you look at it outside of a sort of a species distinction perspective, what you could say is that, you know, uh, uh, um, there is a dynamic relationship that creates a kind of dynamic balance of living forms uh, and even between living forms and non-living forms that, that uh, you know, that, that, that achieves kind of uh, equilibria um, or or harmony, if you will, to use a, a different term, and that that it emerges organically. You know what I mean? That it doesn't have to be self-reflective for that to happen. So you know, humanity evolves, if you want to use the Darwinian term, um, organically over millions of years, as did many other species. If we want to sort of separate them out, they did that in dynamic relationship with with one another. It was very effective, you yeah. know. It it, it 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 allowed for the continual emergence of life. And and that for me is the the, the first step to then say, okay, how how do I actually? Because I completely to say that clearly, I I don't really like in in that 
graphic that is maybe at some somewhat overused that of the spectrum from business as usual to green to sustainable to restorative yeah. to regenerative has that classic sort of hierarchy like it it's it's meant to to actually do the opposite i believe it's meant to show that it's a spectrum in which we can pick up anybody on that spectrum working in different ways and say i appreciate you doing a little bit better like you you're somewhat doing a few greenwashing pro uh, projects that um mean you use a little less um, raw materials and a little less energy um because it's the beginning of a journey and then so on but but i i, I do find it creates this destination regeneration perspective again that's right that's and, right I think that... regeneration is not a destination regeneration is a fundamental impulse of life that's right that, that has been there for 3.8 billion years at least on this planet and who knows how much longer in in in, in wider contexts and for me that was the biggest misunderstanding like you, you know you you write something or you you communicate something and then the test is always how people talk about it because then you kind of go, uh-huh, well, I have been either understood or misunderstood. And yeah. the kind of utopian Fata Morgana of the regenerative culture that Hosiana will ride over the hill and save all of us because we will live in that way, don't you see, is the wrong understanding yeah. well it's a, I, I i agree with you that that you know as as useful as that graphic is yeah. i think it does essentially apply a kind of modernist um progress narrative in, in that it does suggest that one should move from the left to the right and that the right is a kind of yes a kind of nirvana if you will and it 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 um, that's not necessarily a bad thing in the sense that, yes, I think there are ways of being that are largely practiced that are on the left-hand side of that graphic, that moving outside of that is certainly useful. But I think that where it goes, where it's problematic is that it's embracing a modernist uh, mm -hmm. or modernist colonialist to use um, uh, uh, the, the term... Um, uh, asserted in the the uh, uh, hospicing modernity by Vanessa um, Ol Oliviari, I think mm -hmm. it is. Um, but the the so I think that essentially that's part of the critique that I was making is that mm -hmm. essentially sustainability and regeneration are interdependent and they're not. It's not particularly useful to. Um, compare them to one another in a hierarchical format, but rather say regeneration is an ongoing process. Yeah. Sustainability is saying, well, is that regeneration, um, can that regeneration uh, sustain itself essentially? It, it, is it, can it maintain ongoing viability? Um, so, you know, I think the thing that's often missed in regeneration circles is that you could have regeneration that actually isn't sustainable in a number of different ways. So, you know, I think the, the, the thing I point to often is that cancer is a very regenerative thing, but it, it kills its hosts. So it's not sustainable in that sense. And but I yeah, use that almost, sort yeah, of, uh, you know, as a, as a provocation, if you will. Yeah, I, I mean, I understand what you're trying to say there, but I think that it's, it's kind of mixing categories of in what level are we talking about regeneration? But just to come back to this other thing um, that, we are, like with regard to life as a planetary process evolving. And mm -hmm. um, I had a wonderful conversation a couple of months ago with Fritjof Kapra, where Fritjof actually su suggested the theme, uh, said, why don't we do an hour on um, regeneration as the essence of life's self-organization? And then he laid out with all the background from the systems view of life, how... Um, like we talked about Prigogine and and the whole mm -hmm. way evolution has actually occurred in a regenerative way that creates this pattern of diversification um, and then subsequent reintegration of diversity at higher levels of complexity. Uh -huh. And mm -hmm. um, for me, that's so important because it actually helps us. Right now, we need to do two things, I believe, to not lose North 
with this regeneration conversation, which is to not see it in that misunderstood way as some kind of it's the new adjective that we slap in front of everything and that is currently selling for consultants to um, do stuff and that the like media will eventually pick up and blah. Um, it's fundamental to life itself. And there's a double anchor there. We, like we were just at the very beginning talking about our human journey and where did we start, some of us start um, to go wrong and so wrong that it then by now for all of us um, is becoming a, a serious survival problem. Um, and we came to agriculture. And I, I think that it is around that time that we lost our understanding of being indigenous to life. And and now we even have this, like, it's great that we finally have a revaluation of indigenous knowledge, but the danger is to separate between an indigenous and a non-indigenous person, because we're all fundamentally indigenous to life. We are manifestation of life expressed by that larger planetary process. Yeah, and that's... That yeah. And and I think it's it's important to un anchor us all in that indigeneity and then life itself in a regenerative process to understand what we're actually trying to. It's not because only when we understand that can we stop doing what I think the big critique on solutioneering and sustainability is, which is fix things in the future. Some like build visions for the future and then backcast and then do milestones and all of that what we actually need is a reperception of the present we need to understand that all around us life is acting regeneratively through our communities through individuals through mothers fathers sons daughters and we need to foreground that regenerative capacity is innate to all of us and i think sustainability is is become has become a conversation about some stuff that we might need to do in the future if we want to be better humans. And that that's not helpful at this point, I think. Yeah, I, I certainly think that there are, are conversations that happen under the heading of sustainability that are uh, are, are, are not particularly productive and, and arguably sort of counterproductive. But but I think that the, the, the point that you're making um, Sort of the larger point that you're making, I think, is is one that I I really deeply agree with, and I've been reading um, Paul Shepard recently, who you know I have some qualms with 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 what he's saying, but but I think the essence of what he's saying sort of ties back into your the the notion that we started with around sort of the introduction of agriculture. So mm -hmm. the point he's making is that humans evolved for millions of years in hunter-gatherer um, uh, situations that essentially formed our biology, that, that we are biologically formed for a certain way of being that we then radically departed from about 10,000 years ago with the introduction of agriculture. And therefore, there's almost an embedded biological contradiction within us as human beings, as, as animals, as sort of um, uh, bodies, if you will, that our bodies evolved for a certain way of being, and then they shifted into a different way of being that, that you know, also introduced the, the power differentials that you mentioned. Um, but, 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 that, is that, but exactly that brings us to um, me or the conversation to, um, one of the great distinctions between working sustainably or like working on sustainability projects as it's very often done, not, I, I know that there are lots of people in the regenerative or oh, in the sustainability movement that that work regeneratively and have done so even 25 years ago, 30 years ago. Uh, um, but it is by and large a conversation about that follows the pattern here, a bunch of problems let's define these problems ever more detailed through a set of abstractions that we bring the brunt of science and technology onto in order to understand the problems better. Then we have meetings of engineers, innovators, and designers hothousing and hackathoning the hell out of these problems in order to come up with solutions. And then we pitch them to the investors in order to then support financially the best ones to be implemented somewhere 
And be pre precisely because in order to heal that rift that you were just speaking about, what regeneration says, you cannot be regenerative in the abstract. You can only work regenerative in the specific, in, in the real dynamic of context, both bioculturally and in historically, and the whole bioregional context becomes significant. And that links to what, what you were just saying, that, that our species for 290,000 years in this Homo sapiens form has been a species of bioregional expressions of ecosystems. Mm -hmm. Yes. that understood themselves as the expressions of the landscape they inhabited or that brought them forth. And that being in direct relationship with complexity, they had just as complex, a, well, not just as complex a world, but they had a very complex world as well. Eh? Right. Um, but they managed complexity through specificity, through being in the detail, through understanding meaningfully their participation in the nested system that they were in. And they were using um, all four of our ways of knowing that we're capable of, uh, like if we're using the Jung mandala of the four ways of knowing. Uh, they were actually, in order to dance and be with that nested complexity that they were in, they needed intuition, sensing, and feeling primarily. And thinking was part of narrative around that but but it wasn't the dominant only valid form of accessing knowledge but we've created in these cultural years since the agricultural revolution and scientific revolution is is a, a blinkers through that dominant worldview you mentioned earlier that that basically condemn us to having to talk this to the end <laughs> and not live it to the end as embodied human beings. And, and, and I think the, the, the whole tradition of regenerative practice as promoted by Carol Hamford and, and Regenesis Group of really working with the specifics of place and context and people in place is a fundamental departure from how um, too many UN-based sustainability and business-based sustainability conversations have been um, going on for the last 20 years. And it's like, I, I, you know that I'm, I mean, I, I wrote the SDG flashcards for Gaia Education. I've been working like with the UN system for 10 years. Um, I know that there are amazing people who care in these systems, but, but I think we need to, and this is where, where I would love to like have a nuanced, um, teasing apart so people under, understand this better, uh, what is different between working regeneratively and sustainably for you, like in, in terms of approach? Um, I actually don't, I, I don't personally uh, distinguish between sustainability and regeneration. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't consider myself, you know, working regeneratively or working sustainably. They're, they're, inter, they're sort of absolutely interconnected Regeneration is a natural process that um, is happening all the time. Sustainability is, is essentially an assessment of that process of, is, can that process sustain itself in the context that it's um, expressing itself right now? So, so essentially, I don't see uh, sustainability and regeneration are interconnected and inter interdependent but they're different things. Regeneration is a process. Sustainability is an outcome, if you will. It's an ongoing outcome. So I, I don't. Yeah, I don't that's an interesting of them. ongoing outcome is an interesting one because it, that's the the other flip. Well, it could be a final out. outcome if if if, if something is unsustainable to the point of of extinction, yeah. then then that that's a, no longer an ongoing outcome. <laughs> I mean, what I find is really helping people to break out of their conditioned crises or problem response or problem solving patterns is precisely making them more aware that when you work regeneratively on a particular problem, you're still working on problems in particular contexts in a, in a, in a community, it's 
precisely the distinction between is it an outcome or is it a process? Um, like the, the the outcome is the delivery of the design brief of the client who said we want a regenerative or sustainable neighborhood or sustainable um, urban sewage treatment plant or whatever. Uh -huh. um, work you you can still work on a ecological urban uh, um, sewage treatment plant regeneratively, but the difference would be that you design a process that isn't finally about the handover of the key of that unit, but it is all about building the collective understanding of the client, the end users, the community, everybody touched why this might be necessary and actually giving them a participatory vo voice in, is it appropriate here? How would it be appropriate? How connect does it connect to this place? And therefore, even when it then is implemented, you don't see it as a final, now we've got the solution, everything is fine, we can go home, but you have built a learning place-based network of people that hold a field that understands if they, if, like we need to, with every solution, check whether it's still sensible every few years because context changes. And and one of, like one of the issues of being final product delivery outcome focused, which is the normal sustainability on and current way of doing things, um, is that that we just create projects and 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 once they're finished, they have they still have agency, but 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 they but they don't land in the community as a continuous process of learning. And and that is one of the fundamental shifts that when you get people into working regeneratively, that they work on projects in a way that the projects be become the catalyst of capacity building um, yeah, rather than that, an outcome focused thing. Yeah, I think that, the, the, that essentially what you've just described, you could take away the label of regeneration mm -hmm. and put the label of sustainability onto it and it would describe exactly the approach that that, that, that i take uh, so mm -hmm. so for example i think that linguistically if we look at the language um there's a there's sort of a school of sustainability that focuses on the context um as an ongoing iterative process so uh context-based sustainability or the principle of sustainability context is as its name suggests inherently context specific and is also, it, and therefore seeing as it's context specific, it entails the kind of engagement with all of the um, uh, actors or um, elements that are, are, are necessary for that particular context. Uh, it also would view um, knowledge, you know, this is, if we look at knowledge as a uh, as a capital or as a element in need of sustaining, there is a constant evolution or um, recapitulation or reassertion um, or reassessment of knowledge in order to be sustainable. So when I said um, sort of sustainability ongoingly, mm -hmm. that's I would say sort of essentially synonymous, if you will, with-, with Absolutely, no, no, that, that's why I tried to highlight it because that that word of sustainability ongoingly is for me, that's the way to work with sustainability regeneratively in the language I use. Yeah, that's but, right. and but, but, but it doesn't like it's, it, also I'm, I'm recognizing that it is absolutely important and like in no way am I having this conversation or am I, seeing myself as the defender of the term regenerative. Uh, it, 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 like I, I find it's important to understand that it's not just the next sexy adjective to slap in front of something, but that it actually has a deep root in life itself and a deep root in our species. Like we have been bioregional regenerators um, for guardians of ecosystems that make them more abundant and more productive, more biodiverse um, for 
all of our journey as Homo sapiens. I mean, the the, the wonderful um, PhD research of Lila June that was recently um, pu published yes. just shows one example of gazillions all around the planet where we where we see that indigenous land management well done over millennia in some places has actually improved the ecosystem because those indigenous people weren't separate from those ecosystems. They were the ecosystem. Uh -huh. That's right. And she's, she's going to be speaking at our conference, by the way. So wow. we're, we're really, excellent. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. We're really psyched about that, but I, I would actually push back on you just a little bit there, Daniel. Um, I, I totally agree. And I see what you're saying about you're not wanting to be the defender of regeneration uh -huh. um, in that kind of um it, I understood the, the the sense that you were that you were saying that, and I actually think all of us need to be defenders of regeneration and sustainability, um, and that's I think the point that I was trying to make is that we have become a kind of victim of the co-optation dynamic that has been happening to both sustainability and now increasingly regeneration in the sense that it has now resulted in a kind of um, sectoral infighting between sustainability advocates and regeneration yes. advocates. And that I think is counterproductive well, because I think that there's there's common cause, there's much more common cause, and 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 actually I I find very little division between sustainability and regeneration. I continue to consider them uh, interdependent, and and uh, you know you can't do one without doing the other, and vice versa. No, I, I I'm I'm with you on that. And as we said from the beginning, there is just such diversity on how these terms are being read and interpreted and worked with. And I guess there there are some people who are saying, okay, that the, the sustainability world has been so fundamentally co co-opted co by a sort of top-down process that yet another one of the distinction points in this place-sourced way of working is that it it acknowledges that to take a new form of being regeneratively as a species on this planet to scale, to a planetary scale, we don't do this by international agreements and master plans. We do it by enabling people in place at bioregional scale to intend to heal the ecosystem, to heal the societal um, lack of cohesion, to heal the fragile local economies and regional economies that, that that we that we eroded in this this blind running for globalization in the 90s and, and noughties. And um for me that that foregrounding of can we solve all these massive poly crises issues by stopping to look at them through the lens of poly crises and by starting to Instead, look at potential in people, in place, everywhere, looking at how we can fit back in to the true biophysical landscape patterns like watersheds and, 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 and biomes, rather than the recent sociopolitical frontiers that, that just add another division to like, now we have division between regenerative and sustainability, and then we have divisions between countries arguing, but the, the like the boats leaking, we're about to sink as humanity, right. either we all pull together, or we can have these childish arguments about um, China versus US or Russia versus the UK and all this kind of stuff. Uh, I mean, they, 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 they're so anachronistic to the urgency of what is actually going on. Uh -huh. that's, that's right. I mean, I think that's very consistent with the the you know at a at at the level of scale of these particular terms. I think that there's much more to be gained from strategic, smart collaboration between folks who self-identify as sustainability and self folks who self-identify as regeneration. I think. Either I could look at somebody on the sustainability side and sort of looking from the outside, I could see blind spots. I could look at somebody who's self-identifies on the regeneration side 
and I could see blind spots in, in what they're doing, or me or anybody else. Yeah. I'm not sort of saying mm -hmm. this is specific to me. I think that that there is, so, so again, I think there's much more to be gained. There's much more common ground between these fields and that essentially these fields, the, 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 the infighting between them doesn't serve either field. It, it actually serves the, the, the unsustainable, unregenerative yeah, activity that's happening. That's, that's much more prevalent, um, the, frankly. I actually I want to try this out with you because I, I feel like we're missing, like we've got sort of the regeneration, the process, um, sustainability ongoingly as an outcome ongoingly. Um, a, a third lens that for me is actually where I'm sensing that maybe we can find a higher potential resolution of any kind of tension between these approaches is in the growing field of, of um, working salutogenically on health, like working, because that, I mean, that was many, many years ago when I when I wrote my PhD thesis, and I, I thought the title of the thesis was going to be Design for Sustainability. And that was the working mm -hmm. title for two and a half years. And mm -hmm. then, then I just, because of a number of things, got a bit <sighs> sustainability. What is it trying to sustain? Who are we talking to? Is it just utilitarian? And so in the end, I, I called it Design for Human and Planetary Health. And, mm -hmm. and introduced this whole notion of Aaron Antonovsky's dynamic evolutionary ongoing learning process of health, not the kind of allopathic understanding of health as a perfect state that we fall out of when we have symptoms and we treat symptoms and we fall back into. And it's it's kind of that's how we are trying to fix sustainability issues very often yeah? in this kind of let's fix this problem, boom. But if we use a salutogenic, like, building capacity to keep ongoingly journeying into an uncertain future, building resilience at local, regional, and supra-regional levels, um, reintroducing redundancies into the system that have been eroded by globalization. And basically yeah. using the few decades we've got left before it gets really tough on planet Earth, to build a decentralized subsidiarity supported infrastructure that allows people to heal their communities, heal their places, and through that contribute in a much less energy intensive and material intensive way to the healing of the planet and humanity. I, I I absolutely agree with what you just laid out, Daniel. I, you know, and whatever whatever language. I, I knew language. we were in agreement. It just it, yeah. Twitter, Twitter yeah. and and LinkedIn and comments that I shot out in a minute always end up dividing. Like we, we almost sounded like we were at loggerheads um, arguing with each other. So I'm really glad we're having this conversation because we're not. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I I think there's there's way more that that um, uh, uh, unites us than than yeah. divides us, and even you know even you know we may have sort of nuanced different understandings. Generally speaking, I think that they they come around to the same thing. I, I, I mean, in particular, I think when we step back outside of the regeneration and sustainability approaches, I think at core, what I hear you saying, if I if I had to put yeah. a label onto it, it would be more of a of a bioregional um, approach that that integrates both regeneration and sustainability perspectives into it, but it's much more of a of a of a sort of a place based or um, a, a localized um, uh, approach that recognizes that you know we as human beings we're not globalized that individually we are inherently place based and therefore mm -hmm. you know that that our engagement. Um, that 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 you know it, to the degree that the human species is going to continue on, it is through individual humans um, reconciling themselves to the environment that they the localized environment that they're that that we are living in. Um, I mean, that, so that because part of what you said is is totally consistent with how I uh, approach things. No, I mean, it, I know we're both, both bioregionalists at heart. And, and what, what, like to, to tie all this, what we've been talking to, together in, in a certain way, I, 
I recently found out it's actually not Gary Snyder who coined the term re-inhabitation. It, it is actually Peter Berg from the Planet Dump Foundation who, who first used it. But mm -hmm. um, in this wonderful speech that, that Gary Snyder gave at the re-inhabitation conference in, in San Francisco, I think in 1977 or 73 or something, he ends with, if, we, if humanity wants to have a future in which we... Um, almost sounding Gadesian, if we live by by the green or if we live by the leaf or like basically if you live from bioproductivity, we, we have to make our cause, we have to make common cause with the remaining inhabitory people of the earth, farmers and peasants and indigenous people. Um, and only if we make common cause with these people will we be able to become re-inhabitory. Um, and I find that really, really prophetic. And he even in that same paragraph starts the line with some of us say we have a destiny in outer space. We are already in space. This is the galaxy. <laughs> and, we are in outer space. And it, so, so, yeah. so, so he, it's, it's really amazing, powerful. And, and, and for me, that, that's the kind of in, invitation that like what I re really appreciate about you and also Ralph's way of working and the intervention points that you create through um, R3.0. Um, it is, to some extent, what I would call Shambhala warrior work, um, in the sense, that, like like with in Joanna Macy's framing, of actually walking into the corridors of power, offering frameworks, reports, and, and, and all of that to people who also care for their children, and are stuck in these bureaucratic or large corporate institutions mm -hmm. and really trying to give them tools that help them to just take it a bit further, like to deconstruct the emperor's power from within, so to speak. Yeah, yeah I often, I thank you for saying that. I mean, I often um, think of it in a much longer arc term in the sense that many of the people that I'm engaging with, I'm going to sort of lose the battle, so to speak, to use that sort of militia-based um, metaphor um, in terms of getting the, the outcome that I would like to see on this particular initiative or this particular company changing itself. But I'm trying to engage the individual person who is going to exist outside of that particular context somewhere down the line. And I, I'm wanting to plant seeds. And I like your term re or the term that, that Gary Snyder or Peter Berg um, introduced, re-inhabitation. Um, that's, that's one that's, that's going to stick with me from this conversation because I think it's actually a better term than earlier in the conversation we were using the term that, that you know, we're all indigenous. Mm. I actually think that we all, I think that it's a, it's a better term to use re-inhabitation, that we're mm -hmm. all inhabiting a very specific place because mm -hmm. I, 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 I like to honor the fact that indigenous um, was coined as a way of, of talking about cultures that have maintained a continual connection to a, a, a specific place that there's. And so I think that human beings are indigenous only in the sense that we all come from earth but yeah. i think indigeneity as a sort of politicized term yeah, yeah, is well, needing to to refer to that so that's I think but, but, but is, is a is a is a term that we can all embrace that we can all sort of get yeah, back, get point. back to the land so to use joni mitchell's term it's it's a good point the, i mean the, 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 the i guess the reason why i've been also in conversation with people who have more right to do so than than I as a white, overeducated, middle class, privileged guy talking about indigeneity. Um, I've been engaging with, with Professor Ann Polina or with, with Tyson Young Caporta, to just, just name two people around this conversation, because I wanted to humbly request, is this really offensive to say we're all indigenous to life? But I mean, every indigenous leader I had the honor of learning from um, would not say that sentence, we're all indigenous to life, is not true. Uh -huh. But at the same time, what you were rightly pointing out, there is a distinction between like long lineage cultures that have a taproot into 
100,000 years in place like um, Anpolina's um, tribe has. Um, and us Western indigenous to life people whose ancestors, in my case, got colonized by the Romans right. and then went and for some other people. And, and like basically we just had that process of traumatization and colonialization a thousand years earlier. And um, and then we had the witch burning and the, 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 the horrors of Catholic Inquisition that that right. um, basically eradicated a lot of that knowledge, but it's not completely gone. I mean, that's that's right. Uh, like the, the but I think um, that the, this ties into an earlier part of our conversation in the sense that uh, I think both you and I, Daniel, have both both spring from cultures that have been um, uh, de-indigenized, I guess you could say, mm -hmm. and and essentially. In some ways, we've been gaslighting ourselves for for centuries at this point by embracing a colonialist mindset, whether we were aware of it or not. That essentially the cultures that we were born into are colonizing cultures that we didn't have an option. It's only now, um, it, you know, it's only when when sort of reaching a state of maturity, both individually and collectively that there's now a, a sort of a, a, a critique um, of this uh, colonization um, dynamic being uh, um, harmful to all involved, that, 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 that there's no winners in a colonizing um, uh, way it, of being. Yeah, I mean, the, it is the outcome of a Power over agricultural mindset, um, extraction mindset, um, and and this is maybe just to briefly come back to that that graphic we started off with with the uh, carousels. We've got about seven minutes. I think you have another call. Yeah. 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 Um, Carol's version of that graphic at the bottom has the four concurrent paradigms: um, extract value, arrest disorder, do good. And regenerative, and I think that's another interesting way of showing where how because you work, can work on sustainability with people in all those paradigms, mm -hmm. uh -huh. um, and the 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 difference of 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 nuance is really the 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 the, the, the regenerative is what what you would call ongoing sustainability, right? Um, I've lost my thread now. Anyway, it, you need to go soon. Um, yeah, no, I, I actually I think that that the, um, this is a good kind of place to. There's one thread that I wanted to to mm -hmm. to, to sort of tie up before we um, before we ended the conversation, and we're sort of we're actually we've arrived at that right now. I think organically in the sense that um, you know you asked about the the definition, the Brundtland definition, mm -hmm. um, and I think that that the 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 really problematic part of the Brundtland definition is that it defined it as sustainable development. And development is not a, I think that there are ways of understanding development such as you know, human development that are, that are you know, that, that hold water. But I think that the term development is a essentially a colonized concept as it's Absolutely. been. Um, so I think particularly the, the way the particularly the way it came out of the um, what was that uh, conference and the, the, basically the, the UN process has been cranking up this conversation of underdeveloped and developed people and has made the global south right. feel um, not up to standard in right. in, in, in a insidious way that allowed to my mind the third big wave of colonialization which was neoliberal globalization yeah that's right um, and and in that process we even lost state actors and democracies as the main rain holders and shifted to large companies and billionaire individuals as the main rain holders and 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 that's a whole nother conversation we can have some other it time so I, of how do no, we I, how do we actually get out of this mess now <laughs> That's that's an open question, uh, yeah. but I guess I would say uh, you know one way of doing it is is to do it through uh, you know conviviality, through um, uh, dialogue, through sort of understanding, and through breaking down um, 
artificial walls that separate us. I, I think that, you know, the, the is it Giles Hutchins uh, illusion of separation that you mm. sort of referred to earlier is that, is that, you know, that's in some ways a core problem that, that, you know, we have been living with for, for um, uh, millennia at this point is that, is that we are artificially separated from one another but if we step back from that, if we lift the veil of that illusion, we actually see that we are interconnected, interdependent um, uh, at core. And so I think that's, for me, that's the, the key outcome of this conversation. Yeah. But that's, that's interesting because it, there's another loop that, with the beginning of the conversation now to end up with. Uh, like when I was saying that truly inhabitory cultures, indigenous cu cultures in the past, before the agricultural departure from from a sustainable being in the world, um, we're very much relying on sensing, feeling, and intu intuiting. Um, it's it's and 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 they were collaborative with each other and the ecosystem because it was the only way to meaningfully survive um, in that context. I think that we're now in a cascading collapse scenario and have been for a long time that will actually help. If we if we get it right, that coming home to place because we will like we're already post COVID and 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 so on, redesigning supply chains even in large destructive industries because they've caught on to brittle global supply chains are dangerous. Uh -huh. But I think this process of building bioregional scale redundancy and resilience to weather whatever is coming is actually the best hedge your bed, a bets strategy yes. between it's too late, it's all going to collapse, or we still have a way through the eye of the needle. Um, because that activity of restoring our communities and regenerating um, at bioregional scale, our rivers, our forests, our soils, our um, ecosystems, is the right path anyway. And if it's not for us, then right. it's for the rest of life. Afterwards. That's right. I mean, it doesn't. It, 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 it's good no matter how you slice it, I guess. Exactly. <laughs> Wonderful. I'm so glad we had this conversation. And uh, for you my too, part, too. we can put it out, out there. There was no sure. need to yeah, censor it. And no, thank you I'm so fine. much. And give my love to Ralph thank when you, you speak to him next. Uh -huh. Take care. Thank okay. you. Bye-bye, Daniel.